Hey everyone, in this video, I'm gonna give you an introduction to and an overview of quicksorts. And by the way, I recently restarted my Patreon page, so I would really appreciate it if you could check it out. I'm gonna put a link to it in the description below. Anyway, let's get started. So suppose you're given an array of integers, for example, this one, and your task is to sort it in the ascending order, just like that. And one approach you can use for this is quicksort. Quicksort implements a recursive function, which we're going to call QS, that takes three arguments, the given array, L, and R. L and R will be two integers uh, that are going to represent uh, the indexes that will show uh, the section of the array that we want to sort. So for example, uh, if you're given this array, and if L happens to be 4, the index of this element right here, and R happens to be 6, uh, the index of this element right here, then after running uh, this function with these particular arguments, uh, this array will be like this. So uh, the section of the array uh, that's between L and R will be sorted just like that. So if you want to sort the entire array using QS, you just need to give the same array with L being 0, the index of the first element, and R being uh, 6 in this particular case, the index of the last element. And to implement uh, this recursive function QS, we'll first take care of the uh, base case. That's when L is greater than or equal to R. If L is equal to R, if they are pointing uh, to the same element, for example, this one, then that will mean that the section of the array that we want to sort has only one element. That's already sorted, so there's nothing to do. And if L is greater than R, uh, it's sort of the same thing. Uh, the section of the array that we want to sort has no elements, so there's nothing to do. And that means we can just return from this function. Okay, so that's the base case, but what about the recursive case? Uh, for that, let's take a look at uh, this example here, where we're given this particular array with L being 0 and R being 6, or the index of the last element of this array. In a recursive case, uh, we're going to do what's called partition. I'm going to explain what it is in a second, uh, but for that, we're going to uh, use this function called partition that takes three arguments, just like QS. Uh, it's going to take R, L, and R. And this is going to do uh, what's called partition for the array for the section between L and R. So let me explain what it means exactly. The first step for partitioning is to pick what's called a pivot. I'm going to explain what it is in a second, and there are different ways of choosing uh, your pivot. But one simple approach is to pick the last element as your pivot. So that's this number right here in this particular case. Then the goal of this partition function is to divide this array into two groups. Uh, the first group is going to be all the numbers that are less than the pivot. So in this particular case, that's these three numbers, minus 2, minus 1, and 0. And those numbers should come to the left of the pivot. And the second group of uh, the numbers that we're going to examine is going to be the numbers greater than the pivot. So those are these three numbers, 3, 2, and 4 in this particular case. And uh, these three numbers should uh, come to the right of the pivot. And obviously, the pivot should come in between uh, those two groups of numbers. So in this particular case, uh, after running the partition function, the array should look like this. Uh, as you can see, after running uh, the partition function, uh, the pivot will come to the center of the array, and all the numbers less than the pivot are to the left of it, and all the numbers greater or equal to the pivot are to the right of it. And we don't care about the ordering of the numbers within each group. Uh, these numbers happen to be sorted, but as you can see, these numbers uh, in this group are not sorted. Either way, another thing to note here is that we're going to write this partition function so that it's going to uh, do that partitioning 
and then uh, it's going to return the new index of the pivot. So in this particular case, that's right here. And so it's going to return three or the index of the uh, pivots. And then uh, we can store it in a new variable, which we're going to call p here. And I'm going to show you how to implement partition uh, later. But let's just here for now say that we already have this function. So after partitioning uh, the given section of the array, we'll already know that the position of the pivot right here is correct. So that means that uh, this position isn't going to change after sorting this entire array. So all we need to take uh, care of after partitioning is this group of numbers and this group of numbers. We need to sort this section and then this section. And we can do that uh, by calling QS on this section and then QS on this section. Uh, we can do that with QS of R, L, and P minus 1. So here we're saying uh, we're going to uh, sort the section of the array between L, which is right here, and P minus 1, which is right here. And then we're going to do the same thing for the other section uh, with QS of R, uh, P plus 1, and R. So we're saying we're going to uh, sort the section of the array between P plus 1 and R. And by repeating this process uh, recursively, we'll be able to sort the entire array. Now let's take a look at how partition might be implemented. But before I show you some code, I'm going to give you an overview of how it works. And for that, I'm going to use uh, an example where we have an array of 11 elements, just like this one. And uh, to explain it, actually, I'm going to jump into uh, the middle of running this algorithm instead of at the beginning. And uh, I'm uh, doing it that way because I think uh, the middle part is easier to understand. And then, you know, I'm going to explain uh, the beginning part later. Anyway, uh, let's say here that we're trying to partition the entire array. And our pivot is the last element, uh, 10, right here. And to run this algorithm, we're going to uh, use two indexes, j and i. Uh, j will keep track of uh, the current number that we're examining. And this is going to be part of uh, a for loop uh, that we're going to use. So that for loop is going to say, uh, move j from the beginning of this array up to the number uh, that's right before uh, the pivots. Uh, and currently, we're examining uh, this number, let's say. And in each iteration of the for loop, we want to make sure that all the numbers we've seen so far are separated into two groups. The first group is the numbers uh, that are less than the pivot. And the second group uh, is the numbers that are greater than or equal to the pivot. And we want to do it in the way that i, uh, this index right here, will always uh, point to the last number uh, out of the numbers uh, less than the pivots. In other words, uh, there are two conditions uh, that we want to always satisfy. Uh, the first one is that all the numbers uh, from the beginning up to i are less than the pivot. And the second one is that all the numbers between i and j, not including i, are uh, greater than or equal to the pivot. And like I said earlier, we're currently examining this number 12. And those two conditions are already satisfied because 12 is already greater than the pivot. So we can move to the next number by incrementing j by 1. And at this point, uh, one of those conditions is not satisfied anymore. And uh, we can fix that by doing this. Uh, we're going to increment i by 1, or move i over here, and then swap the values at i and j, uh, just like that. And that way, those two conditions are satisfied again. So all the numbers uh, up to i are less than the pivot, and all the numbers after that uh, up to j are greater than or equal to the pivot. So we can keep going, uh, move j 
over here. And since this number, uh, 16, is already greater than uh, the pivot, there is nothing to do. So let's move j uh, over here. And as you can see, the number at j is less than the pivot. So we'll need to uh, do the same thing. Uh, increment i by 1, or move i over here, and then swap the values at i and j, just like that. OK, and uh, let's uh, finish this up by moving j over here, or by incrementing j by 1, and then uh, doing the same thing, uh, increment i by 1, and then swap the values at i and j. All right, and as you can see at this point, uh, this array has been uh, grouped into two groups of numbers, uh, the numbers less than the pivot and the numbers uh, greater than the pivot. But the last thing we need to do is we need to make sure that the pivot is between those two groups. Uh, we can do that uh, by swapping the pivots with the value at uh, i plus 1, this value right here. So let's swap those two values just like that. And then we're done partitioning. Uh, like I said, from our partition function, uh, we're supposed to return the index of the pivot. So we can just return i plus 1, because that's the index of the pivot. OK, uh, so now that we hopefully understand how this partition algorithm works, let's take a look at some pseudocode. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, we're going to call this function partition, and it's going to take three arguments, uh, the given array, L, and R. And this function is going to apply partition to the section of the array between L and R. Uh, let's say here, as an example, that we're given this particular array with L being uh, the beginning of the array, or 0, and R uh, being the end of the array, or 6 in this particular case. And the first step of this function is going to be define the pivot. And that's going to be uh, the value at R, or the last element of the section of the array that we are trying to partition. And that's going to be 0 in this particular case. And then uh, we're going to define i to be l minus 1. In this particular case, i will be initialized to minus 1. And then uh, we're going to run a for loop uh, for j from l, this element, up to r minus 1, uh, the last index before the pivot. And in each iteration of this for loop, uh, we're going to check if the current number that we're examining, or r of j, is less than the pivots. Uh, if that's the case, uh, for example, uh, the current number we're examining, minus 2, is less than the pivot, which is 0. Uh, if that's the case, then we're going to increment i by 1. And then uh, we're going to swap r of i and r of j. Uh, so those two numbers happen to be the same number in this particular case. Uh, so we're swapping uh, this number by itself, and nothing happens. Uh, but let's continue with this for loop. Uh, so after that, uh, we'll move j over here. And since uh, the current number that we're examining, 3, is uh, greater than or equal to pivot, so nothing happens. And so we move j over here. And at that point, uh, this number is less than the pivot. So we're going to move i over here. And then we're going to swap the numbers at i and j. And just like that, uh, we can keep going with this for loop until j is right here. At that point, our array is going to look like this. Uh, j is going to be right here, and i is going to be right here. Uh, after that, we want the pivot to be uh, between those two groups of numbers. And we can do that uh, by swapping r of i plus 1, uh, this number right here, 5, and uh, our pivot, r of r. So that's uh, this number and this number. And once it's swapped, 
uh, 0 will come here and 5 will come here, we just need to return uh, i plus 1, the index uh, of the pivots. OK, uh, so that's my uh, pseudocode. Uh, but you can check my actual implementation in Python and Java at this URL too. OK, so that's the quick sort algorithm. But what about the time complexity? To understand this, uh, we'll need to consider the best case, the worst case, as well as the average case. So let's start with the worst case. Uh, that's when the given array is already sorted, like this one, or uh, when we have a lot of uh, duplicates in the given array, like this one. And actually, the time complexity of these two cases will be the same. So let's just consider uh, a case where the given array is already sorted. Uh, for this particular example, uh, to sort this array with the QS function that we saw earlier, we would call it with the given array 0 and 6. Uh, so 0 would be right here at the beginning of the array, and 6 would be the index of the last element of the array. And the pivot will be this one. And after running the partition function uh, for the entire array, uh, actually what's going to happen is uh, the pivot will stay here, and all the elements uh, will uh, stay where they are. So nothing uh, is going to happen to this array. And uh, after finishing a partition, we'll need to call QS for the rest of the array uh, other than the pivots. Uh, we can do that with uh, QS of R and 0 and 5. And we end up uh, doing the same uh, sort of thing over and over again. So we would call uh, QS of R and 0 and 4 after that, and so on, until we get down to QS of R, uh, 0, and 1. So the pattern we see here is that the number of elements uh, that we need to examine in the QS function starts at, let's say, n, the number of elements in the entire array. And then uh, we get down to n minus 1, and so on, n minus 2, uh, up until uh, 1. So as I said, uh, this is the number of elements uh, that we need to examine in the QS function, uh, each of these numbers. But it's also the number of uh, iterations that we need to go through in our main for loop. Uh, to be precise, you might say if we have n elements uh, given to the QS function, we'll need to uh, go through n minus 1 uh, for loops in our partition function. But it's roughly n. So if you want to add up the total number of uh, for loop iterations that we need to go through for this entire uh, execution of the function, then we can just add these numbers up. So we get uh, this one, n times n plus 1 divided by 2, uh, which is O of n squared. And that's why we get uh, O of n squared as the time complexity of the worst case scenario. And what about the best case? Well, the best case is uh, every time we chose our pivot, it happens to be the best choice. Uh, so it means it happens to be at the median or at the closest number to the median of the given section of the given array. So as you can see in this particular case, uh, the number of uh, integers less than the pivot is equivalent uh, to the number of uh, integers greater than the pivot. In the best case scenario like that, we would start with n elements that we need to deal with in our QS function. And then uh, in the subsequent calls of QS, we would have to deal with n over 2 elements in one of the calls and n over 2 in the other one. Uh, it's going to be slightly less than n over 2, uh, but it's going to be about n over 2. And in the subsequent calls after that, uh, we would need to deal with n over 4 elements and so on uh, until we get down to uh, single elements. And what's interesting here is uh, if you look at each level, if you look at uh, the top level, for example, uh, you can see that uh, we would uh, go through about n for loops in our partition uh, function in this level. And if you look at uh, the second level, uh, we can do the same kind of analysis. For uh, this call uh, in the partition function, uh, we would need to deal with n over 2 for loops. And for this one, 
uh, we need to deal with n over two uh, for loops as well. So uh, the total number of uh, loops uh, that we need to go through for the second level is going to be O of n as well, or about n uh, loops. It's going to be the same thing uh, with this level and uh, this level as well. And this kind of analysis will show you that uh, executing everything on each level will take O of n in time. And you might say, well, how many levels do we have uh, in this um, recursion tree? Well, we can uh, use the same kind of argument uh, as the one uh, I used in my binary search video to show that uh, the number of levels here is going to be about log n or log 2 of n. So basically, what I'm saying here is that we have log n levels here. And for each level, uh, the time complexity is O of n. So to find the total time complexity for the best case scenario, we can just uh, multiply them together, and we get O of n log n. So that's the time complexity for the best case scenario. And uh, you might say, what about the average case? Well, it's more tricky to think about. Uh, but given a few assumptions, uh, we can actually show that the time complexity for the average case is also O of n log n. And uh, by the way, those few assumptions are first that there are no duplicates, uh, so we don't have a case like this. And second, uh, that the ordering of the array is random. And I saw this proof uh, in a book I used as a reference to make this video. So in case you're curious about the proof, I'll uh, put a link to the book in the description below as well. OK, and before I go, I uh, wanted to mention a few things uh, to note about uh, the implementation details. Uh, the first one is how to choose the pivots. Uh, of course, in our implementation, we chose the last element. Uh, but another method is to pick a random element uh, as your pivot. Or equivalently, you can, uh, before running uh, our quick sort function, you can reshuffle uh, the given array randomly and then pick the last element as the pivot. And another method for choosing the pivot is called median of three. Uh, the idea of this approach is instead of uh, picking one element, uh, you would uh, choose three elements randomly uh, from the uh, given section of the given array. And then you would pick uh, the median of those uh, three numbers. And that way, uh, you'll be able to decrease the probability uh, that you would uh, pick a bad uh, pivot for the given section of the given array. OK, and the second thing uh, I wanted to discuss is uh, dealing with duplicates. Because as we saw, quick sort doesn't perform well when there are a lot of uh, duplicates in the given array. Uh, one way to deal with this is called uh, three-way quick sort. Uh, in case you're curious about it, I'm going to uh, put a link uh, to a page that describes this method. Uh, but the idea of this method is that uh, instead of dividing uh, the given section of the given array into two groups, we divide it into three groups. Uh, the first group is going to be the numbers less than the pivot. Uh, the second group is going to be the numbers equal to the pivot. And the third group is going to be uh, the numbers greater than the pivot. Uh, again, in, in case you're curious about it, I'm going to put a link to a page with more info about it in the description below. Anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to talk about um, in this video. I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, thank you, as always, for watching my videos. I'll see you guys in the next one.